Well, hello everybody, and welcome to Top Programming Tips and Tricks with the incredible programmer, Brad Schiller. I'm so glad that Brad has taken out uh, time from his very busy schedule to uh, share some words of wisdom with us. He's so talented. Uh, Brad describes himself as a lighting geek. Uh, he got into this industry uh, very early. Um, he's worked as a, a, a technician, a programmer on many different productions, including The Crystal Method, uh, Tim McGraw, Shania Twain, uh, The Oscars, The Grammys, The Super Bowl, uh, the Sydney Olympic opening and closing ceremonies, and Metallica, just to name a few. So Brad has some experience. He also has helped develop some of the leading consoles and moving light fixtures from brands uh, like High End Systems, Verilite, and current, he's currently employed at Martin Lighting. I'm so glad uh, that Brad is here with us today. So let's welcome Brad Schiller to this Zoom In interview. Well, welcome, Brad. Thanks so much for taking time out to do this. Um, we just read your very impressive bio, and I'm kind of curious, like, how did you get started in moving light programming? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I'm very happy to be here. Um, as far as getting started, my path was a little different than most because I started, well, back at the early days when automated lighting was just getting started. So my path was a little different, being that the lights weren't everywhere and the consoles weren't everywhere. Uh, however, the basic process of becoming a programmer is still kind of the same. I had to go find shops to go that had moving lights, which in my case were early IntelliBeams, which were moving mirror type fixtures. And the controllers were not consoles like we have today. They were rack mount units that had push buttons and a joystick. Um, very odd. And what I did is I went and found local lighting companies where I lived in Dallas. And I said, I want to learn about how this new technology and I want to use it. And I played in their shops and I figured out how to do it in their shops. Um, and then I was designing a show as a, uh, like a community theater type show. And I took my design fee, which wasn't very much money. And I rented one IntelliBeam and I worked it into my design of that show. And that was the first time I ever programmed a moving light. And it was, if I look back at it now, it's probably pretty atrocious, <laughs> but I took, I really wanted to do it. So I had the passion and the drive and I took it and moved it and made it happen. From there, the, my career just kind of grew. I kept learning more, I kept doing more, getting opportunities, working in the shops, going in on my own time to play with the lights. They saw that I knew what I was doing. They wanted to hire me to do gigs for them. That's still a great way for people to get involved in the industry and get started. Go to a shop and start learning. You can program all you want at home on your offline visualizer, it's great to help you, but if nobody knows how great you are, it doesn't help at all. Mm. So. That's what I suggest is go forward and uh, let meet people and meet the shops and show them what you can do. Mm. They're here. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, you've been programming for a while now. You have some pretty impressive names uh, under your resume, uh, the Olympics, Metallica, amongst others. Um, you know, what, what are a couple like programming tips and tricks that you would have for other programmers? So one, one of the key things I like to really focus on is that a lot of people don't think about is when you record a cue, there's a lot more than just you've made your look and you hit record, enter, or record five, enter. There's a lot of cool things you can do that will speed up your programming. So for example, one of the ones I really like to use a lot on most consoles, it's called record remove. And with the record remove, what that allows you to do is actually remove data from that's already stored in a queue. So if you're editing a queue, let's say you have a queue and all the lights are on stage and they're in blue and then you've got two of them that are yellow and you don't want that yellow to be there anymore. You want to edit that out. Well, you just want to remove it so it'll track the previous values. Well, what you can do is just grab those two fixtures, give them any color value and then hit record remove to that queue. Record remove Q5 enter. And whatever you've adjusted, whatever parameters are adjusted, the similar data will be removed from that queue. It's a really quick, easy way to edit queues and edit queue data is making use of record remove. And it's something I don't see a lot of people make use of, but it's extremely, extremely powerful. And as soon as you understand that it doesn't matter what value you give the parameter. So if you want to remove the intensity, just give it any value at full and then hit record remove in that queue. And it'll just remove the intensity data from that queue for that fixture or fixtures. Really a wonderful tool. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah, and something else going along with that that I, I stress it's important to understand 
is also how to remove parameters before you even record. Um, in some cases, it might be called knockout or it might be called off. It depends on the console. But typically, you hold a button on an MA, you hold the off key, and you press the parameter type. So intensity, focus, color, beam, shapers, whatever that is. Or you wiggle the wheel while you're holding off, and it will remove the data for that parameter. And this is extremely useful. Again, if you turn a fixture up at full, and then you want to move it to a position, and you see it on stage, but you know you only want to record the position. You don't want to record the intensity because of your tracking data. Well, you can off the intensity before you record that cue, and that value will go back to whatever it was previously. And now you're only recording the data that is in your programmer at the time, which is the pan and tilt, and not the intensity that you turned up first. So it's kind of similar to record remove, but that's called knockout on a lot of consoles or just mm -hmm. offing parameters. Yeah. And those, those are really powerful tools that I suggest people learn about and make use of. Yeah, that sounds really helpful. Um, and for my MA folks watching, uh, in the new MA3 1.6 release, they actually introduced that. Uh, as it's called filters now in MA3, which is very exciting. Oh, you um, so yeah. you get to filter data out of queues essentially when you store it or after you've stored it if you want to remove it. Yes. That's really helpful. So Brad, when I was getting started programming lights a couple of years back, um, I was, you know, kind of overwhelmed by the amount of resources out there. Um, you know, uh, there's just there's just so much, right? You see these massive rock shows and you're like, how do I learn to do that? How do you how do I even start? Right. And one day on Amazon, I just stumbled across um, the third edition of your book, the automated lighting programmers handbook. And I'm telling you, all right, that book was the book that got me started with programming. All right. I had a basic, you know, kind of fundamental understanding of DMX, a couple other, you know, lighting terminology things. I've done a couple small gigs on like ETC expresses and stuff like that. Um, and so just being able to have a book with everything that I need to know to get started was just so valuable to me. Like what was an MIB queue, right? What was a mark queue? What was a, you know, a follow queue? What, what was all of these different like terms that you hear all the time in console training videos and all this kind of stuff. But if you don't know what that means, it's, you know, it's not really worthless, but then it's also to have these like case studies of how to actually apply these in real life was incredibly helpful to me. And you just put out the fourth edition of this book, a newly um, redesigned cover. Uh, you know, I'm really, really excited about this. I'm going to order my copy literally when we're done filming this. So okay. can you kind of quickly, you know, give us the overview? What is new in this edition? And, you know, how is this going to help our young programmers getting started today? Yeah, and thank you for, uh, for all the, the kind words on the book, because that's what I wrote it for is to share the knowledge. I've always believed in my career, it's very important for us to share our knowledge with each other. Um, back when I started out with those IntelliBeams, people held the knowledge close. They didn't want to share because there weren't many programmers. And if you got that programming gig and you knew what you were doing, you could make a lot of money. And so people didn't want to share the knowledge. They didn't want to teach. And so as I grew up through the industry, I said, I want to help share the knowledge and teach what could, goes on because all this can improve together if we all learn together and then we can improve as an industry to be better and more professional. So that, that's kind of why I wrote the book. Um, and I'm really excited about the fourth edition now. I've updated it to include, include a lot more things. It's actually the most comprehensive and the largest update ever. Um, very excited about it. There's many different things in there. There's some things about uh, emergency cues and working in emergency situations, which we all know is very relevant uh, considering the recent news and other things mm -hmm. that have happened. Um, there's new sections in there about expanded uh, capabilities when recording, when working with visualizers. Um, there's lots of just different areas that I've enhanced and improved. I'm also very excited about the appendix. In the back of the book, in the past, I've had three different appendices back there that have a, a diary of the Olympics, which is still there from when I worked the Olympics in 2000 in Australia. But now I've also added a 20-year retrospect where I interviewed gave my opinions, but also interviewed other people that were on the programming team with me as we look back over 20 years, how the industry's changed from when we did the Olympics wow. back then. So that's been added. And then I interviewed the team from Early Bird Visual, and that's Eric Marchlinski and Kirk Miller and Zach Pellets. 
uh, about how they, their workflow of how they work on these massive shows from Taylor Swift to the AMAs to, to just all kinds of different types of productions. And we really went deep into how they work on the consoles, how they lay out the consoles, why they do what they do. And I think a lot of people get a lot of great instruction from reading what they do and how they do it. And then I also interviewed uh, Scott Tussin, who's a Broadway programmer, and he programs on the EOS consoles, of course, and about his experience programming on Broadway that he's been doing for a number of years now. And again, how he sets it up, how he makes layout views and, and his workflow. So I'm really providing the readers with lots of opportunities to see very relevant mm. case studies of how people are working with the current consoles and in major productions as well. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I love the team over at Early Bird. They're so talented. And Scott was one of the first programmers I reached out to when I was learning programming. And he's been okay. an absolute um, in incredible mentor in that as well. So that's so incredible. I am so excited for that. Uh, everyone watching, you can find uh, the link uh, to that book uh, and more resources below in the description. And while you're at it, like this video and share it so that way more people uh, can learn from Brad's wisdom. Brad, I just, uh, before we, you know, hop off, because we want to keep this short and sweet uh, for everyone watching, what, what is like a word of wisdom you would give to programmers who are just starting out today? Well, you know, I'm going to give you two. Let me give it to you because one's right. not good enough. <laughs> uh, the first thing is label everything. All the consoles have capabilities. A keyboard is physical or it's on the touch screen. Label everything. You should never have a cue list or a sequence that's just called cue list one. You should never have a preset or a palette that's just called preset 27. Label everything. Hmm. It will help you immensely down the road, whether you think so or not, whether it's a one off, whether it's a big tour, label it all. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's really good. The other thing that can help you through everything, not just through programming, but through design, through life, and I, I try to follow and use a lot, is remember the KISS rule. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm. It's very easy, especially as a programmer, to fall into a trap that you've got this great idea in mind. You want things to sweep out and do this and change colors at each moves and da-da-da, and you start programming it, and you want it to be this grand vision. Reality is it's for the chorus of the song, and it's about the band. If you don't have to make it that complex. If it's going to take you three hours to program this one cue, maybe that's not the best thing. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you keep it simple, just make it a fly out in one color. You don't have to do all this other stuff. It will be just as good and you'll put your effort towards the entire production, not just that one moment. Mm -hmm. So again, you can use it in programming. You can also use it in your own personal life for many things. When things start to get heavy or you start to get that tunnel vision, remember, keep it simple, stupid. It will mm -hmm. save you quite a lot. That is so good, Brad. Well, thank you for taking time out to do this. I know we all appreciate it. You're amazing. Thank you so much, Brad. You're welcome. And thank you, Jonathan, for, for putting all this together. Really appreciate awesome. it. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for taking time out uh, to share all those words of wisdom with us today. I found it really helpful, and I hope all of you guys did too. So please share this video, like this video, and of course, check out Brad's book, the fourth edition of the Automated Lighting Programmer's Handbook. I was not kidding. This is an amazing resource to all of the programmers who are just getting started and who are not just getting started. Maybe they're getting back into the industry um, or they just want kind of a, a, a fuller picture, um, not just from the sector that they're working in, right? So check that out. All of those links are in the description. And of course, while you're there, you should like this video. Have you not liked it already? I mean, if you watched this far, you should probably like it and share it. I hope this was really helpful. We have more Zoom in interviews uh, coming soon. So please subscribe and you'll get notified when all of those hit. And check out my other uh, console learning resources. Um, I have resources for MA, specifically MA3. I also have a Vectorworks crash course and a couple other resources up there as well. So check that out and I'll catch you guys later.